Well, thanks everybody. Um, welcome to this, uh, this joint meeting uh, of the Physical Oceanography self form team and the Arctic of, um, Observing System sub team. Um, so this is a part of a, a series that we're uh, working on right now uh, to, uh, to talk about, to discuss um, Arctic Ocean uh, Observing. And this is the second in the series. Um, and just to get started, let's uh, skip on the roll call, but if everybody could um, enter their, their name and affiliation in the, in a chat box, that would be, uh, that would be great. Um, so just as an update, IARPIC is the Interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee. It uh, aims to foster collaborations uh, on Arctic research across the uh, six agencies, departments, and offices across the U.S. federal government. Um, physical oceanography self form team is the, one of the latest additions to the, uh, the collaboration team uh, framework that um, uh, facilitates these collaborations. And um, Jujin, Dimitri, and myself started it um, uh, maybe last year uh, or in, 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 in the start of this, uh, this year. And the Arctic Observing System, uh, which is led by Sandy Starkweather, um, Will Ambrose, and um, Sally. Um, and it focuses on the, it's part of the, uh, the environment uh, intelligence uh, uh, collaboration team. So today we're gonna to be starting uh, to talk about um, our Arctic observing uh, through gateways. We will start with um, updates from the UN Decade for Ocean Science Planning um, by, by Sandy. Uh, so Sandy, you wanna, you wanna take it away from here? Yeah, hi everybody. Um, nice to see you all. And I did, very last minute, pull together some slides uh, from the UN Decade uh, meeting just to orient everybody a little bit. And so I'll share those slides, but I apologize for the low quality of them. It's been sort of a crazy day because we had one of our, our workshops today for the meeting and I recognize some familiar faces from that meeting. Um, so when we last had our, our joint meeting with between the observing team and the post, we talked about the UN Decade for Ocean Science plans. Oops, I got a, a little feedback for um, the Arctic region planning process. So the decade is kicking off in 2021 and we're doing preparatory work now. The motto of the decade is the science we need for the ocean we want. Um, and we, uh, those of us engaged in the process uh, have spent a lot of time reminding people as we did on our last call with the post that this is the, ocean, the UN Decade for Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. It's not the UN Decade for Ocean Science for Ocean Scientists. And so there's been a heavy emphasis on societal benefit and how we use societal benefit to guide this planning process. And that's been playing out. I'll show you some of the themes from the decade. Um, and so this is really hard to read and um, I'll have my slides uploaded but basically the, the decade is a process of a kind of a, a grassroots pull of activities, projects, programs of relevance to the societal outcomes uh, that are desired for the decade. And so as you can see there, there's kind of multiple steps in this flow and the Arctic is one of the regions that they've called upon to contribute regionally specific actions, a regionally specific action plan into the broader decade actions that you see on the left. Those decade actions are gonna build upward into objectives, challenges, and outcomes ultimately. So we're really at the threshold of the process. But for those of us involved in planning, we know that framing and the threshold of the process can sometimes be the most important part because if you don't kind of get your foot in the door at the beginning, uh, you can miss opportunities. And so because of COVID, the plans for an in-person workshop um, were altered into a virtual uh, sort of series of more task-based workshops um, that are being facilitated online in um, smaller segments and that are gonna build up towards a bigger public forum for the Arctic region uh, discussion. And so in the middle of the screen, the, the two blue arrows are actually pointing at the kickoff meeting, which was October 1st. And uh, that was for the co-chairs. 
Um, the kickoff meeting for the collective of people who signed up for the workshop was on October 22nd. We had our first mini workshop on October 23rd. As I said, there's some people, uh, Lars and others who I see on the list who've been part of that process. And I would invite them to chime in uh, um, when I'm done, which is in just one moment. Um, we Today, we had our second workshop. Um, they're spaced about two weeks apart. We certainly have found that we haven't had time to have the conversations that we need. And, um, and I think we're also, as you can imagine, in a virtual workshop dealing with time zone issues. And so I think we're going to go through some, some changes in the process so we can be maybe more inclusive of uh, uh, North Americans, especially Alaskans, in, as we uh, move our meetings forward and figure out how we maybe can find some more time to get the work done, because it's really a pretty heavy lift. Um, but there are the dates for um, uh, the public meeting, March 16th and 17th, as after we walk through this large kind of collection of information and synthesis process. Um, so I mentioned that there are these societally relevant um, outcomes that the decade is trying to work towards, and you can see the language um, for those outcomes, a clean ocean, a healthy, resilient ocean, et cetera. I've been co-chairing the predict predicted ocean topic um, with Mark Payne from the Technical University of Denmark. And I think that that's really a, a topic of keen interest to this group. Um, so uh, I'm just gonna leave my remarks there to say, since last we discussed this, when Craig Lee and others introduced the topic about three months ago through this joint meeting, um, the process has now begun. We're in the middle of it. We're doing some course correction because it's uh, difficult to do this kind of work in a virtual setting. Um, but if you're interested in getting engaged, here's hopefully you see some names on this list that are familiar to you and you can reach out to them and say, or myself and say, hey, I'd love an update, tell me more. Um, if I want to get my ideas on the table, how do I do that? Um, so I'll just leave it there and, uh, and hand it back to you. Uh, uh, Wilbert, I don't know if you want to invite any comments from those who've been participating in the working groups. Sure. Thanks, Phil, uh, Sandy, for the, for the update. Um, if anybody has have, uh, questions or additions, um, maybe, maybe Lars from the, the Norwegian perspective. Um, well, thank you. Uh, I think it's been very, uh, you know, inclusively got a lot of ideas uh, gathered and these uh, online Google, was it called jam, jamming boards or something was, was really effective. And I think, you know, the task left is to merge all those suggestions into some meaningful bullet points and, uh, and then make a prioritization. Priori uh, you know, make uh, make a, a list of uh, action points, I guess, or something. You know, so but very very uh, difficult, but uh, good start. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Sandy, if one uh, comment that you that you made is that what this was about sustainable development and not about um, Arctic science. Um, is, is that is that a, a particular choice that was that was made here or? Um, can, can yeah, you so, that? Sure, I'd be happy to. The, so the, the, the UN decade was um, initiated uh, jointly by the, the well, the, the International Oceanographic Commission and the IOC is really leading this charge. And as a UN body, I think that they, um, uh, they wanted to emphasize that if they were gonna bring the level of policy and planning attention to something like an ocean decade, that they wanted to make sure that it was well rooted in uh, in sustainable development goals, um, and that that and they felt that in rooting it in sustainable development goals, that they would attract a broader range of actors to the table for planning and setting priorities. Um, so while the while the the kind of in the crosshairs is ocean science, that's the UN decade for ocean science. Um, the kind of follow on piece is that it's not ocean science for ocean scientists, it's ocean science for sustainable development. And, and in, in kind of shifting that frame, that's really help, help in their mind, hoping to bring a broader range of actors 
to the table. And I, you know, as Lars said, they want it to be a really inclusive process. And that's certainly difficult uh, to do virtually. It's difficult to do in person, um, but that's the idea. And is then the, the OFA um, goal of this activity is that to coordinate or stimulate research um, and to coordinate across different, uh, amongst different nations and things like that? It is, yeah. So um, it, it, I think it's kind of a similar scope of thinking as something like an international polar year. Uh, it is to definitely generate and drive a, a, a higher degree of international dialogue, cross-sectoral dialogue. Um, so they're kind of bringing the convening power of the UN to bear on uh, on this. You know, so they've got they've got a pretty strong policy mandate um, that can get people lined up. I think some of the some of the issues we discussed the last time is that because of that strong policy mandate that comes from the UN, it also can leave things feeling pretty high level and not necessarily well tied to the kind of concrete on the ground actions that a lot of us experience more on a day-to-day -day level. And so, you know, the, the kinds of language that I've heard, there's no money, right? It's uh, one of these things where there's no new money, but they are trying to create an improved funding environment through having these conversations. So activities that get collectively rec recognized through the decade as being critical um, are certainly those that are gonna um, probably uh, find themselves in a friendlier funding environment than you know, if they haven't been stated. It, it's just sort of a, that imprimatur of a lot of people have put their heads together and thought about this. Just a short comment Excellent. from the, the Norway's the Norwegian Research Council has said that they they will let their future calls for Arctic Ocean research be heavily influenced by by what you uh, summarize, Sandy. So so we that's why I guess we're <laughs> partly why we're active and, and and want to make sure that there's good signs in there as well. So but it you know. Yeah. But can you say, I mean, is, is there taken any tough decisions about, you know, the oil industry, which some of us will say is not so sustainable? I mean, if they want to make us <laughs> do predictions for them, do we t make a tough decision and say, we don't really want to work with you or? Is that a question for me, Lars? Yeah. That I think it's above my pay grade, <laughs> in fact. <laughs> but but your point is well taken. That uh, I think whenever we invoke uh, the concept of sustainable development, that it's you know it's one of those kind of boundary terms that a lot of people have a different relationship with, and would find you know uh, sea ice forecasts for the oil and gas industry as being sort of antithetical to sustainable development. So I hope those conversations happen. Um, you know, if you kind of refer back to the, the outcomes on the list, a clean ocean, a healthy and resilient ocean, um, those types of things, a productive ocean, um, many of those things would be presumably hampered by, by increased fossil fuel extraction and consumption. And so, um, you know, I think those are the tensions that are that are going to play out in the process, and um, I think it's great to raise those those issues um, in the process as well. Great. Any any more comments or or questions? All right. Thanks, Thanks so much, Sandy and Lars. So let's move on to the next part of the agenda, which is the discussions about um, sustained Arctic uh, or sustained observations of uh, gateway transports um, that exchange uh, material between the, the support North Atlantic and, uh, and the Arctic. And um, so we know that there are kind of four gateways, um, Bering Strait, uh, Davis Strait, Prem Strait, and, and Barnes Sea opening. And um, so we thought it would be great to invite um, colleagues from, from Norway to, um, to discuss their efforts in observing uh, Barentsy opening transport and, and Framstrait transport. 
So we'll start. Uh, so we have two presentations by um, Öystein Skarset and Laura de Stur, um, and we'll start with um, with Öystein. Um, he will be talking about monitoring of the Atlantic inflow in the Barents Sea opening. Um, so, Öystein, if you want to share your screen and. We're very pleased to have you guys, especially this uh, this late time of the of the day, 7 p.m. right at 7:30 by now. Is it just a second. Or so? Okay, can you see the presentation? Yes, it's looking great. Thanks. Oh, super. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, the Barents Sea and the Barents Sea opening, which is uh, a monitoring program that is. Uh, uh, capturing the Atlantic water flow into the Barents Sea. Um, and, and this uh, responsibility for this is, uh, it's, it's uh, Randy Ingvaldsen at the uh, Institute of Marine Research, which is uh, responsible, but she could not uh, do this presentation. So I, but I have also worked a, a bit with the Barents Sea and the Atlantic water flow from the North Atlantic to the Barents Sea and yeah, to the Arctic. So, uh, so we are uh, a fisheries institute, the Institute of, institute of Marine Research. So we are we are doing this to support fisheries and to understand the variations in the fish in the fish stocks, and so to help to to, to better understand the variations in the in the in the large fish stocks and how that changes the ecosystem and uh, in the low in the Barents Sea. I guess I just see if I can. No. Okay, yeah. Uh, so just the Barents Sea in the kind of the larger picture. So of course this is a this is a, an area where a lot of heat escapes to the atmosphere, and and the, and and with water mass transformation causing dense water that flows at depth into the Arctic basin, and then also a sink of carbon. And of course this is a one source to the to the to the deep water returning in the North Atlantic. So it's uh, important, and it's it's the major area of uh, of uh, dense water or intermediate water to the Arctic. So, but I, I will since uh, I have worked a bit with the Atlantic water flow uh, before it enters the Barents Sea. I will just start with saying that uh, uh, what the experience or what the variability we observe in the Barents Sea opening that is of course caused by processes in the North Atlantic, for example, it's lots of variations in the subtropical subpolar gyre interactions. And there it has been a, a kind of a, a wealth of paper describing and discussing the variability observed in the North Atlantic. But that, of course, that sets the characteristics of the water masses that eventually then enters the Barents Sea. And so I, I will not go through all this mechanism, but I will just make one point uh, for the very longest time scale, and that kind of fits the Atlantic multidecadal oscillation, uh, which is the, the lower panel. Um, I know it's, of course, it's, it's, it's a large scale thermometer of the North Atlantic or from the equator to six degrees north. And if we put the cooler sections, which is the Russian series from the interior Eastern Barents Sea, you see that on the longer time scales, they they follow quite nicely. So in a, in a sort that the cooler section is a local manifestation of a large scale variability in North Atlantic, at least on the Atlantic scale. So that is on the lo very longest time scales that the Barents Sea follows the Atlantic Ocean. If we then then move into the Norwegian Sea, I should say that uh, the the IMR, uh, yeah, maybe I, I guess maybe you can see. Can you see the mouse, the cursor? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes, we can. So yes, we can. Yeah. yeah. So so the the Institute of Marine Research we do a lot of monitoring in the Norwegian Sea and the Barents Sea, and that is uh, we do kind of repeated hydrographic sections, which is shown here, for example, Svina section into the Barents Sea. And also, for example, west of Spitsbergen. Uh, so we have, uh, since the 1970s, we have have been doing 
regular sections um, at most uh, four to six times a year, typically at, at the main sections. Um, since 2002, we have uh, had, had uh, Argo uh, drifters in the Norwegian Sea and in the Greenland Sea, Iceland Sea. So that now has kind of uh, extended our monitoring. Uh, we have uh, fishery surveys, which kind of large scale surveys, and then we have also coastal stations along the coast of Norway, which goes back to the 1930s. But then also we have these current meter mooring array, and that is in the Barents Sea opening. And now also we have uh, have taken over the uh, monitoring that the, the Geophysical Institute, the University of Bergen, has been doing in the Sweden section. So now we have current meter moorings uh, in west of uh, west of Norway and into the Barents Sea opening. And this this has been going on since the mid 90s. So, uh, and then from these hydrographic sections, we have kind of uh, well covered uh, how the variability in the Atlantic water properties changes uh, um, with time along from, from salt to the Barents Sea to the Salt Cape section. And this is shown here in the temperature and salinity since 1955 till 2005, just an example. This is an old uh, paper. So what we see is typically that, okay, the, this is, this is the southern, it is getting colder going northwards, of course, so the, the Atlantic water loses heat. But we see a main thing is that the variability, they tend to, you see the lots of the signals, they tend to propagate northwards. So there is a kind of, a, um, you can kind of, if you have, if you observe an anomaly in the Sweden section, you can likely observe it in the Barents Sea a few years afterwards. And that is kind of, uh, if the air sea fluxes are uh, uh, normal. But also we see that, for example, in the 1990, 1990 it was a small anomaly in the, in the south, but then it, that is amplified northwards. So it is much much larger signal in the Barents Sea and Sørkap than compared to the further south. So it shows that also, also local processes, local air sea fluxes varies. They are not the same from year to year. So signals can amplify and also they can be dampened. And also, for example, we see very clearly the in salinity, you see the, the great salinity anomaly returning to the Norwegian Sea in the 19, uh, early, late 1970s, very clearly here. And also that uh, warm and saline tend to, warm and saline and cold fresh tend to cool via, which is kind of the, represents the characteristics of the Atlantic water. So we have, the hydrography, hydrography in the Norwegian Sea is well covered, and no, we have not shown the Argo data. And Argo data is, of course, if we have been also doing looking at the ocean climate in the Norwegian Sea, we can kind of uh, look at this is the depth and time. So no, this is just uh, uh, deviations from the climatology. You see that this uh, it is has been warmer in the late period. But maybe the most interesting now is the, for example, the salinity, which dropped quite a lot in the recent few years. So the Argo data, they also provide very important information. And this is maybe for people doing modeling, this kind of data is a very robust measure, I would say. Okay, so then go to the Barents Sea opening. Uh, so this now just, okay, so here you see, this is where we have, uh, this is the, the entrance to the Barents Sea at 20 degrees east, that's the Barents Sea opening. It goes from the Norwegian coast to the to Beer Island. And uh, so this is, um, it is basically, basically occupied by 17 hydrographic stations, but uh, the current meter moorings, they are typically four or five moorings in the core of the Atlantic water in the middle. So we, we do not uh, capture the Norwegian coastal current and we do not uh, basically, we, at the regular basically we don't, all, we don't either capture the, the outflow, which is following the, the slope south of Bear Island. Uh, but we can see, we have, uh, we see for example, this is just the, the temperature of the Atlantic water, we see it has been kind of also scale disappeared behind there, but it's about uh, five, six degrees. 
and it has been kind of warming since the 70s and to the maximum early 2000s and a steady warm and then there has been the recent few years there has been um, uh, cooling uh, and also I should say if I plotted the salinity the salinity has been decreasing even more so there has kind of been a large freshening in the in the in the Barents Sea recent years um, yeah and uh, and maybe I will just say some words about this figure this now shows the this shows that this is kind of a cross sections looking from the Norwegian Sea into the Barents Sea. So you have Norway here, Beer Island, and uh, the white lines, they show the mean velocity from current meter data. So we see that the, the mean current into the Barents Sea, this is called the, the flow into the Barents Sea, the eastward component of the observed current. So it's like, the, it's like four centimeters um, on mean into the oops it's disappeared on mean into the barren sea um, and then you have so it's the zero line so and then we have the return outflow increasing with depth um, toward west in the just sort of bear island so that's that is kind of the mean picture and now we have not captured um, uh, the, the coastal current which is uh, a very uh, coastally confined current but it's kind of large uh, transport, so it's a stronger velocity. So this is kind of one thing that we miss uh, with this uh, uh, current meter monitoring, but it has been very difficult to, the, and the reason for this is that it's due to fishing and also that the topography here is very difficult. So if you, we have had, the, for example, a mooring here uh, at this yellow point, and the, actually the current, the local current went toward the north uh, west, and that is just Simply because it was, uh, yeah, it was a poorly placed location because the, but it, it's very sensitive to the topography, so it's it's it, it's difficult. We have measured the coastal currents further into the Barents Sea, so we have some papers describing the it further into, but I've not come back and not discussed that here. So, uh, but then to just show you some of what we observe typically in the Barents Sea, and this is a paper from Lars Henrik Smetzer in. 2010, I think, and it just shows now the seasonal cycle. So, I mean, so the observed seasonal cycle from the moorings of the Atlantic water is that you have a winter maximum. This is heat now in transport in terawatt, and this is the scale here is typically, this is a Sverdrup, so you have typically uh, two Sverdrup on mean Atlantic water flowing into the Barents Sea with a winter maximum, a minimum in April with associated with winds typically turning from turning and then a typically relative summer maximum and then increase a fall again and it's it is wind is an important driver of this current uh, we recently had a paper in nature climate change where we um, discussed briefly the the long-term changes in the or the non-changes in the the Atlantic inflow to the Barents Sea, and we, we see that it's a, it's a lot of variability, so the, it's a kind of a big spread in the data. This is an attempt to estimate the, the uncertainty in the observation. So, but typically, it's two sword groups, very very weak trend. If there is a, it's likely not it's not significant, but it's a, yeah. If there is a trend, it's a very weak positive trend. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, and of course there are. Uh, uh, of course, one important thing is the the mean is one thing, but also of course how this uh, Kuvar is with uh, other eras is of course an important thing. And uh, this just shows a comparison between the observed transport in the Svinö section, which is on the Atlantic flow further south and into the Barents Sea, and we see that there seems to be some correspondence uh, for example we have a but but also it's it's not a one-to-one -one relation that is for certain so I, I will just say that we, we have data but it's uh, we see both uh, records shows a very pronounced seasonal cycle and that is uh, so both but you can say that both of them are wind driven but uh, the there are also details in the wind field that 
can cause them not to co-vary perfectly. Uh, and also, I can say that uh, on the shorter time scale, it's uh, it's a uh, it's a. I will just skip this one. Um, instead, I will just uh, go now to to kind of look at some what that uh, variability of the Atlantic could flow along the Norwegian slope, and then with the entering either the Fram Strait or the Barents Sea. So. Uh, Typically, what we find if we compare now the currents in the Sweden sections, the northward the slope current in the Sweden sections, and what is turning or the variability into the Barents Sea, you see that when they are both strong, so both strong flow northwards here and into the Barents Sea, we have this kind of uh, mean sea level pressure field, which kind of is a NAO plus pattern that extends into the Barents Sea. And oppositely, when they are both weak, we have a kind of a very weak atmospheric forcing. And of course, we can then look at uh, when they are one is strong and the water is weak. And there's, we have been doing this uh, a bit, but it's still not, I think it's still uh, room for improvement, I think. But um, certainly the atmosphere is, drives boat current, but it, um, it depends on, for example, if the lows are progressing over Norway or if they kind of progress into the Barents Sea. Another Question is the splitting of the um, Atlantic flow into the Barents Sea and to the Pram Strait. Uh, this is some work that we started together with our friends at AVI, that they have this uh, array uh, in the West Pittsburgh current. Uh, and so now we had the, the two records, the Barents Sea um, time series is here and the um, West Pittsburgh current. And they, and from these, and I think that is uh, likely also the cause. Um, there is, uh, was a paper by Shafik, for example, in 2015, uh, where he looked at the, for example, what kind of uh, comparing now with sea surface height data. Um, so when at monthly scale, when this, uh, the strong, the flow was strong here, then you have kind of uh, sea level pressure, sea level that was high in the, on the Norwegian coast and uh, low in the interior. So you have a gastrophic flow northwards you can think about. And similarly for the west Pacific current, you have kind of had a high sea level over the shelf and lower in the interior, not a weaker signal. Uh, but then maybe if one then look at for the, and yeah, and also then we did the same for on the interannual scale. And what you see is, uh, yeah, when we have a kind of on the inner and the annual scale, we have a kind of a stronger flow in in the West Pacific current. It was kind of a, a high in the Barents Sea, in the northern parts of the Barents Sea, and a lower in the southern part, which kind of should indicate gastrophic currents toward west. So it kind of, uh, in a way, supports the idea of splitting of the current. When you have stronger currents here, you would have kind of a weaker current in the Barents Sea, into the Barents Sea. Uh, so, uh, yeah, and then, uh, then of course there is this question about uh, what is happening with the, what has been used, this, this kind of mirroring data has been used to calculate the heat transport, and it has been used to then to predict this, to, to the changes in sea ice uh, at one year after, for example. This is typically been done by uh, Orton, as uh, in the Smetsurus, Olaf Henrik has discussed uh, the kind of the, the heat loss, the area of open water in the Barents Sea um, in relation to the inflow. So, and also that uh, larger, more heat into the Barents Sea extends the area of open water with then larger heat loss. And that, the, and that we kind of have we kind of investigated more recently. And we found that, uh, yeah, I think I will. I just say, maybe say that okay, we have um, from the hydrographic data in the in the Barents Sea, um, we see that okay, this is the sea ice, the, the this is the condition for the 80s, and this is the the, the warm 15 last year, and we see that um, the the warm colors, which uh, seems to then extends further into the Barents Sea during the recent period. So we see that the, the, the warm water extends 
cohorts know a much larger part of the band C. And, uh, and this is the zero degree line, which is now shifted much further northeast in the Barents Sea. And yeah, and again, that goes back to the Lars Henry kind of uh, old idea that, okay, larger Atlantic inflow should increase the area of open water and then increase the overall ocean to atmosphere heat loss. And then that would again increase the transformation of water. And we have uh, been investigating if the recent data shows this. And we kind of, we now see that the, for the recent period, we see that there is reduced ocean to atmosphere heat loss in, the, in this part where, we, where the blues are dominating. So it's actually, overall, it's um, less heat loss in the Barents Sea during the recent period compared to earlier, even though there is an increased heat loss in the area where sea ice has vanished more. So in the recent years, we have more this, more this uh, situation with increased southwesterly winds, uh, warmer air, more humid air, which again has reduced the ocean to atmosphere heat loss, and then that has reduced the transformation of water. And if you now look at uh, just look at the outflow waters, they tend to become, for example, in the northeast. This, the blues was the situation in the 80s. The red is from the, the last decade. And we see that there is an increase from typically minus one to zero degree. So, uh, and also slightly more saline. But this is so, so the outflow waters from the Barents Sea to the, to the adjacent sea seems to be become uh, at least warmer and also more saline due to a more saline inflow. So I just think I will stop with this last figure and say that, okay, the Barents Sea opening data, they go back to, I mean, it's both current meter data. It's a lot of uh, hydrographic data, four to six times a year, uh, together with fisheries and um, nutrient data, zooplankton. Um, so it is, uh, it's an, and it, so it's a kind of observing system, which is designed both for physics and biology, I would say. So it's also used a lot by biologists to kind of to, to discuss ecological changes in the Barents Sea. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you. That's terrific. This is a really, really insightful presentation. Einstein. Um, oh, thank you. We're running a little bit, uh, bit late. So my suggestion would be to um, uh, transfer it to, to Laura now and then save the discussion for after Laura's presentation. And then we open it up for a Q&A with both Laura and Austin. Is that, is that okay? Excellent. I'd love to ask a uh, question. Laura? Oh, well. Okay, sure, go ahead. And, All right. well, and we'll ask Laura to, um, to bring up her presentation in, in the meantime. Okay, well, I just wanted to ask, so the, the Barents Sea cooling machine is, is slowing down or turning off or something. So, so of course, it's air, sea, heat, you know, there's a delta T there. And so the, the water is warming up a little bit, but, you know, a couple of degrees. So, I mean, why is it, why is this cooling machine turning off? It's because the, the air is so much warmer. Is that right? It's mostly about the air warming or what? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, the, the situation has been that at least during these uh, typically 50 or since the 2000, it has been a tendency for more southerly winds in the Barents Sea. That has been, a, that is the observed. So, and the reason for that, of course, is <laughs> that is difficult. So you have to ask the atmospheric people, I guess. I understand, but, but so, 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 so who cares about the atmosphere? We're, we're, we're oceanographers, but but the point is that it's the the air is warming uh, a lot, and is that is that right? So it basically yeah. can't, you know, it's like not cold anymore, so it can't absorb that heat from the ocean. Or, or yeah, I think so. It, yeah, that is. Yeah, so I think so that uh, I mean, if you have let's say cold air breaks out, cold air from the Arctic blowing out over the warm water, you have strong, very strong heat fluxes, and this situation has been less during the recent decades. Well, that's that's interesting that you say that. I mean, is it a is it more of a um, an event driven thing where there's 
you know, less cold air outbreaks, like you just said, or is it just sort of a gradual atmospheric warming? <clears throat> I, I would uh, be careful to kind of to characterize it in detail, I would say. Okay. But, uh, but at least the, there are less or there are more soldily winds. If you look at the southern component of the wind, that has increased. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Excellent. All right. It's time to share your screen, I think, right? Yeah. Here's All you. right, perfect. Yeah, looking great. Thanks. Go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks for inviting me to give a overview of the, the work we've been doing in the Fram Strait, uh, in the Western Fram Strait, that is, the East Greenland's Currents is the focus. And we have this observing system there, the Fram Strait Arctic Outflow Observatory. Um, this is not just work by myself, of course, because it's a big uh, observing system. So um, collaboration within the oceanography and sea ice and ocean biogeochemistry. Uh, uh, my collaborators are listed at the bottom here. Um, the system here is just shown um, uh, as uh, in, the, in the bigger picture of the currents. Oestein already talked about the West Pittsburgh current and the Barents Sea. <clears throat> Here you just see the sketch of those uh, different branches going uh, to the north. And then uh, the, the cold fresh water uh, comes out through the uh, uh, eastern Fram Strait, western Fram Strait and the East Greenland Currents and through the Canadian Arctic Archipelago. So the Fram Strait is important because there's a lot of heat through it going to the Arctic. Uh, and then the return uh, circulation is such that there's a lot of fresh water sea ice and return Atlantic water, uh, as well as carbon uh, coming from the Arctic Ocean to the North Atlantic and the Nordic Seas. Uh, the East Limit Current exports about 45% of the Arctic freshwater volume transport and 90% of the Arctic sea ice and 50% uh, of returning Atlantic water, uh, which is then uh, uh, mod modified uh, just north of Fram Strait in the Arctic Ocean or uh, within the Fram Strait. Here you see a, a cross section of our of the setup, the way it is now. Um, this observing system has been uh, basically installed in the 1990s, early 1990, um, for the first moorings in the East Greenland Current. Um, you see the uh, uh, Alfred Wegener Institute moorings uh, in the West Pittsburgh Current, close to Svalbard, and the uh, Norwegian Polar Institute moorings in the East Greenland Current on the other side. Um, and you also see that, um, as opposed to earlier years, there used to be also moorings within the central Fram Strait, but that's no longer the case. So the, the mooring arrays now focus really on the, um, the boundary currents here. Um, you see also in a small cartoon on the bottom right, you see there this recirculation within the Fram Strait, which makes things very complicated to interpret and to understand. Um, so, yeah, I'm not going to go into much details here. I'm not going to go through all the, the science that we have done or could be doing. Um, but I want to focus in this talk about the freshwater and sea ice exports. You also see in the, the, the cartoon here how large the East Greenland shelf is. And you see that the moorings, we uh, only capture really the core of the East Greenland current and a portion of the shelf. Uh, but we, we do not measure all the way to the coast, which is a big data gap. So this is what we focus on, uh, or what we've had uh, for uh, a long time, at least since 1997, this configuration. Uh, right now we're expanding and we are able to get uh, another shelf mooring out just this last year. And we're also uh, adding more instrumentation uh, to be able to measure closer to the surface. So it's an exciting year, 1990 to 2020. That means we have three decades of data. Um, we're not quite up to date with all the analysis yet, but um, I think we have a very exciting project uh, going on right now. Um, I'll come back to that in a minute. So just to show you the, the cross sections uh, of our mooring array or mean temperature and velocity uh, from our mooring data uh, right here. And you see the, the moorings on top of it. So you clearly see this cold polar water there at the surface, and then you see also this Atlantic water uh, recirculation, uh, recirculating at the array. Um, and the velocity there is given on the right. This is a long-term mean uh, field from 2003 to 
2016. So this was a result um, from updates to the, of the freshwater transport with the East Women's Currents uh, relative to a salinity of 34.9. Um, and basically it shows already that throughout the years, the, the mooring array has, has undergone different configurations. So I guess what we're learning is if you have a mooring in one place, don't move it or add another one to it, uh, but don't start moving things around without really knowing uh, what the impact of it is. And you see here in the, the first five years, basically, uh, the moors were located at 79 north. Um, and we found a very different temporal variability of the current. Uh, later, when the moorings were moved just a little bit south, but it was enough to get more into this recirculation area of the of the Frem Strait. So first of all, the, the basically the volume transport increased. Uh, because of this recirculation, so we also measure we measure stronger current and therefore a larger freshwater transport as well at a little bit southerly latitudes. And then the blue line compared to the gray line, it basically shows that adding one mooring to the shelf in 2004, roughly, uh, that had a large uh, uh, cost for uh, we measure more freshwater uh, transport, basically. So, yeah. Um, and then the main thing to, to point out maybe that there was a period of uh, a couple of years between 2011 and 2013, roughly, that was elevated uh, freshwater exports uh, to the south through the Fram Strait. And this then accumulated uh, into this figure. This is the anomalous freshwater volume uh, that uh, relative to sort of a baseline that was uh, determined to be 2003 to 2009. And then the anomalous volume transport relative to that baseline, if you accumulate that, you could see that um, since 2009, there's an increase of the freshwater volume that came out of the Fram Strait. And this is roughly one third of a GSA, which was found to be 10,000 cubic kilometers over 10 years by Korea and Moritz in 2005. Um, and then it, this was found that over the same period, uh, this was a larger contribution of, of freshwater then was coming from the Greenland ice sheet during the same period. Now, these figures, all of them are right now uh, being updated. Uh, I'll come back to that in a minute as well. Um, then I just shortly want to mention the, the sea ice transport, which is, of course, uh, very important. Um, the, the Arctic sea ice is changing very rapidly, and we see that as well now in the Fram Strait. So this uh, was only a time series up to 2015. Uh, which basically shows a declining uh, sea ice volume through the strait. Uh, and this declining volume export is basically due to thinning of the sea ice. Um, the, um, the sea ice area and velocity in this particular figure uh, come from satellite remote sensing products. Um, but also this uh, figure is currently being updated. And we also have now more actual in situ or ADCP data of sea ice uh, velocity. So we want to compare the, the in situ uh, sea ice velocity with the satellite remote sensing products that were used in this figure. OK, so now we have this big project uh, called FRECARC, uh, financed by the Norwegian Research Council. Lars Hendrik is also a partner in this. He is the co-supervisor for the PhD students. Uh, basically, uh, we use all this data that I just presented to to get uh, a good view of okay, well, how is this freshwater export now changing um, uh, in this last 30 years. So we're going to include the historical data from the early 1990s that was not included yet in the volume transport of the ocean liquid freshwater. And we're going to investigate how the, how the Arctic Ocean freshening and sea ice decline, uh, what's happening with that. Can we identify trends, changes, and uh, determine what drives variability in this 30-year uh, period? So those are three work packages uh, with Todoras, a PhD student, working hard now on the uh, freshwater transport, Hiroshi Sumata working on the, the sea ice volume, and then we do a synthesis, and we also include uh, collaborations with modelers in the last work package uh, to identify uh, the drivers. So we hope to be quite productive in the next few years and also be able to provide a lot of data then to, uh, to the larger community. So, but I, I just showed a few time series, but, but what do we need to look at? This was a paper um, published by Schauer and Losch, uh, 
last year, 2019. And uh, when Todoros saw this paper, when he started his PhD, he was uh, he was ready to uh, to look for another job, maybe because he was very uh, frustrated. Well, he was going to work on fresh water, and then at the same time, this paper arrives. Um, but it's not so bad, maybe. Uh, we we will uh, we will work uh, uh, both with this paper and also with what we have and what the community still likes to see. Um, so basically, yeah, the freshwater transport uh, is maybe not always a useful parameter because uh, it's dependent on the salinity uh, reference you choose. So you can basically get whatever you want based on your choice of reference salinity. So yeah, in any case, what we do now is we, do, we still present freshwater transports um, in different, uh, for different uh, reference salinities. Uh, so that you can actually convert them into one another, um, as well as that we present the salt transport. Uh, you should you see this in the, the, the middle plot. Uh, so we have a volume transport, the total uh, volume transport, and then the salt transport is the red line. Basically, the salt transport follows the volume transport. So, and volume transport in the uh, at this latitude of the Ishmael current is determined by uh, also this uh, seasonal cycle of the wind forced. Uh, gyre of the Nordic seas. Um, so then what we also do is we, we look at the mean salinity and try to identify changes and trends there. And over here now, this is basically the, um, uh, the full transport, uh, so top to bottom of the instrument current at the mooring array. Um, but we also see that, so okay, maybe a fresh water transport is difficult to interpret because it consists both of salinity and velocity, so you never know what's driving what. You need to do a careful analysis of both separate components. Uh, but we also find that, okay, looking at the mean salinity of the whole instrument current is maybe not so useful either. Uh, so we're going to look into this more into different water masses and look into isopycnals, uh, different density classes, and see how these parameters change. So then just a little bit of a hint what we can expect for the sea ice in the, in the Fram Straits. Um, not surprisingly, that continues to thin. Um, here you just see um, the, the, the record of sea ice thickness uh, measured by the upward looking sonar in the blue line at the bottom. Um, and then in the green line, you also see the ice concentration. Now, this is just a sort of an update from 2016 to 2018. And you see the summers. Uh, basically, we see ice free areas. The Eastern Current is completely ice free, even in Fram Strait in the last three summers. Um, so that also has a big impact on the ice volume export, of course, and that is work in progress and hopefully we can see uh, that being published next year. So just a little bit about sources of uncertainty. How is my time? Um, yeah, well, we, we try to get closer to the surface uh, to measure, uh, because that's where the biggest salinity um, variations occur, of course, so we need to get close to the surface. We do that with these ice cats, weak links and inductive modem technology. Uh, basically, that the data is stored in a data logger, even if we lose the instruments uh, due to sea ice, uh, for example. And we also added this year then this mooring on the shelf. This is just cross sections from the, uh, the cruise that we just had in September. So you see the top is salinity and the bottom is the uh, geostrophic velocity. Um, so this mooring F20, we try to get that in that core uh, on the shelf there. So that will also provide very valuable information, I think. So how do we contribute to the bigger picture? I just want to make a little advertisement for ASOF. That's the Arctic Subarctic Ocean Fluxus, Fluxus uh, Group, to say, or consortium or network of people. Uh, basically, it was, um, I guess, um, started through many different uh, projects. The first one was then called ASOF. Um, uh, either by EU financing or uh, national financing. Um, and this is a group of people who uh, voluntarily come together every year and we discuss um, all the results related with Arctic Ocean and exchanges between the Nordic Seas and the Arctic, uh, fluxes through Bering Strait, Davis Strait, Fram Strait, Bering Sea opening. So I just wanted to make a little advertisement for that. Um, uh, and there are also, uh, of course, products and publications that come out of that because of these people meeting with each other. Um, and we provide these gateway transports and, and then people 
uh, make a bigger picture out of it, which is really valuable. And this is the last publication from Tom Hain. It was just accepted today, I heard. So he sent a GRL commentary to um, the paper from Jan and Laiho 2020. 2020, yeah. Um, Arctic Ocean freshening uh, linked to anthropogenic climate change, all hands on deck. And there, there are several more papers, of course, that came about through uh, all of us coming together and putting our time series together uh, to try to understand the big picture. Now, I also want to advertise for this. We just met with the ACE of uh, Steering Group last Monday, and it's really useful to, to start thinking of updating our website. And we also organized a workshop two years ago with Oestein Skagset, just presenting uh, in Bergen, where we met with oceanographic modelers and all the gateway people where we really want to do a better job maybe at uh, providing our data and time series and data products to the modeling community. So hopefully we can update our website soon with that and also put links there on where you can get the data. So then just this is our website from the Framstrait Arctic Outflow Observatory at the, the Norwegian Polar Institute. So if you go there, you can also find uh, references to publications. And also we start to be better now at putting the data sets out there. So please take a look there. Then something I don't have time to go into full depth here, but we do have a very extensive water sampling program as well. Each year when we are there uh, in August, September with the vessel. So uh, we basically take all these parameters and uh, try to distangle the sources of the fresh water. So river water, precipitation, sea ice, meltwater. Uh, we quantify the nutrients, uh, try to identify Pacific water. We uh, are looking at ocean acidification and we try to identify and determine the age of Atlantic water masses. And I think that's it then. Yeah, I just want to show these last two pictures. Um, the East Greenland current at this latitude is changing. This was typically the state we found each September up to 2014. So we, we still had sometimes problems in the sea ice. Uh, nowadays, it looks like this. And that has been like that almost a consecutive last three years. Uh, so things are changing quickly and it's indeed all hands on deck, I think. So that's what I wanted to tell you. Thank you. Oh. Oh. Terrific, Larry. Terrific, Larry. Thanks, 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 thanks very much. much. Thanks very much. Um, so we're at the top of the hour. Uh, I know that Liz has to, uh, to sign up also, but I think that Xuxing can, uh, can take over the, the controls of the, of the meeting. Um, so if people have still some time to hang on, um, to stay on this meeting to, uh, for a little bit of a discussion, I mean, that would be, that would be great. Um, so but for those people that have to sign off, thanks uh, for, for joining and um, just stay in touch and we'll uh, post the recording on the, on the meeting website. Um, so are there any questions for either Laura or Ursa? Um, Um, I, I do have a question related to the first talk. Go ahead. Uh, okay, so I was uh, thinking about the um, the results from the Argo floats, and I was wondering. I was especially thinking about the uh, freshening that you were showing toward in the last. Um, I don't know. Um, maybe 10 years or so. So, so of course the results depend on where the, the floats were, you know, where they were um, sampling the, the data. So do you have a sense of, you know, whether they were sampling the whole of the Norwegian Sea or, or you know, the whole of the Nordic Seas or certain areas in particular? Uh, I'm sorry, I think you're muted. Sorry. Oh, you're okay, okay. yeah. Okay, uh, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, so we had uh, typically 10, 15 Argo drifters at the same time. And uh, for each specific drifter, we calculated the, the anomaly from the climatology. So to make it less sensitive to where the drifters were. So mm -hmm. we, we tried to consider the, uh, careful to avoid uh, the location of the drifters to kind of influence the result. Mm -hmm. 
So we, we have done it uh, as good as we can to kind of to reduce the drifter position. Uh, we, of course, we also see if you only look at the uh, fresh water in the boundary current, then you also see the similar thing, but maybe a more rapid signal going through the northwards. So, oh. but I think this is more an integrated thing for the whole uh, Norwegian Lofoten Basin. Yeah, I guess I was wondering, you know, for those years where you do see the freshening, uh, whether you know, you know, whether they were sampling one area versus another, or no, they were... I think they were kind of. Uh, I think we had sufficient sampling to say that we covered kind of the whole uh, area. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Are there any questions? I have a question. Hi, everyone. Uh, a question or comment to Laura's talk uh, regarding the problem of the freshwater uh, estimate. And this is the long standing problem, uh, which bothered a lot, at least myself, and I know some other modelers. Uh, I think the way we calculate freshwater is not conservative, uh, both uh, in terms of the reference salinity and how we integrate it. First of all, um, in many papers, I find that uh, freshwater content is integrated over some uh, surface threshold, uh, threshold by the salinity value, um, which is not conservative because if fresh water is mixed down into the deeper layers, which are, um, have higher salinity than this threshold value, then um, this fresh water will be lost from the calculation. So I think the correct way is to integrate over the whole water depth, allowing um, uh, freshwater content to be negative in some cases, means uh, freshwater deficit. Uh, and the second um, uh, point is uh, regarding the reference salinity. I think uh, the way how we calculate um, freshwater uh, should be uh, revisited in the community. Uh, and I, I, I know that some um, papers also uh, already use, um, for example, salt mass uh, instead of freshwater content. And I think this is more conservative way to estimate the uh, freshwater content uh, in terms of um, uh, amount of salt accumulated in the uh, ocean. Um, so uh, the same refers to the freshwater fluxes, I think it's better to calculate um, the fluxes in terms of salt mass fluxes. Uh, and uh, I also have a question to Oystein. Uh, so correct me if, I, if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that uh, the um, surveys that you presented today uh, mostly cover uh, the, the deep section of the uh, Barents Sea opening. And we don't really know what happens in the uh, southern sh sh on the shelf region south of Svelbard, right, which is about 200 kilometers wide. Am I correct? Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, so you mean the between Beer Island and uh, Spitsbergen? Uh, yes, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, that is uh, that is not covered, but, uh, but I guess the exchanges will be small because the topography is kind of very shallow there. So I doubt that you will have much exchange but of course there are some but uh, i think it's relatively small but of course you're right it's not covered but it's it's shallow so it will only, at least only be a thin layer and most of the flow is topographically steered so it will not uh, cross the, this shelf easily mm -hmm. but uh, there are some yeah Lars Henrik has been studying there so he might add something Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, it, there's a little bit of Atlantic water coming in and then there's a mini Arctic ocean in Storfjorden, right? So some dense water formation and ice uh, uh, brine release and then, but it go, goes out again in the Fram Strait. So I think they've seen the, a dense water plume on the, below the West Bispergen current west of Svalbard, but it's fairly yeah. small. If there's no other questions uh, to, I mean, uh, Laura, you 
Well, both uh, very nice presentations. Thank you. And, 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 and Laura, you didn't get to the mechanism. So you, you see this variability of the freshwater fluxes or, 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 or let's, you know, as uh, Dimitri says, I mean, it's, but it's, at least you didn't get to the mechanisms why you think these fluxes of polar water from the north are varying. Can you say what you think is the main, main driver? Yeah, well, the the main driver on longer time scales would be really the, uh, the, the 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 Beaufort High, so release and accumulation in the uh, in the Arctic. Um, then again, on um, shorter time scales, at least the freshwater, like I know you've been working on this, of course, the sea ice export uh, seems to be closely re closely related to the. Um, basically the pressure gradient across the Fram Straits. Uh, we cannot find that in freshwater transports uh, as clearly. Um, and I think this is also just simply because we have this difficult quantity of freshwater flux, which is difficult to understand. So I think it just helps a lot if we then look into volume transports of low salinity water, for example. Um, so, and yeah, uh, no, but Todoros is working on this and um, yeah, first of all, uh, trying to update the time series and then quantify it uh, and looking into the large scale upper, uh, um, the, the, the upper ocean circulation connected with the large scale Arctic Ocean circulation. And then also looking more into the, the shorter time scales. So with the ice disappearing and becoming thinner, we expect also the uh, freshwater to be much more variable on shorter time scales. Um, but first order is really, I uh, would say, storage and release in the Arctic. Wind driven. Great. Uh, thanks so much. Are there any, any more questions? I see that. Um, as you're getting as a uh, question for Esteem, uh, can the river runoff change affect uh, freshening in the Barents Sea? Yeah, I saw, uh, yeah. Uh... So if the river runoff can cause the freshening of the Barents Sea, and I think, uh... of course, the, the coastal current carries with uh, it uh, the river runoff from the fresh wall, from the carry. So the, the coast current is a fresh boundary current. So of course, that's close into the southern Barents Sea, and likely also um, part of that will, especially during summertime, it will tend to spread out over the Barents Sea. So, uh, if that now varies from year to year, that is, uh, it likely does. But uh, to say that that uh, I th at least the recent freshening in the Barents Sea that is due to fresher Atlantic water that I can say quite surely. But uh, of course, there are likely some variation dependent on the wind conditions where how much the coast current will spread out in the Barents Sea. And to Laura, how much uh, fresh water might we be missing on the Western Greenland shelf? Laura, do you have some thoughts on that? Yeah, I was just formulating a reply to uh, Yevgeny. Um, I would say maybe 20 to 30%, but of course we don't know because <laughs> uh, what we do have, we have estimates in the summer from CTD sections. Uh, we can get a pretty good estimate there, um, but now we have a mooring there as well. But earlier results from uh, Ben Rabe, I think it's 2014 or 12, 2012 paper maybe, show that on summer CTD sections, basically you have uh, all the way between the Greenland coast and about 11 and a half degrees west, you actually have zero net southward transport because you have northward flow along the coast and then southward flow. So only if you go to about 10 and a half degrees west and then eastward of that, then you capture the, the, the southward flow. So there's also a recirculation on the shelf. So if you capture only half of that again, then you overestimate the southward transport. I would explore. Um, yes. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I just uh, have a quick comment on this. My question came through the fact. Yes, we sort of curious about the recirculation, about the 
uh, shallows in the uh, on the Greenland shelf, and because you have a seasonal variability of the dynamics there, so potentially this water, fresh water pool, might be actually getting in the into the East Greenland current or somewhere else. I'm just curious whether people consider this some kind of change in the seasonal dynamics of this uh, fresh water pool around Greenland. Sorry, I was probably not making much sense, I guess. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. I, I can. I can uh, answer your question mm -hmm. based on the model results, and uh, there is work uh, going on, um, hopefully in collaboration with uh, uh, Laura Laura's group, uh, where we're trying to uh, understand the, uh, how much is missing uh, of the shell of the shelf transport from observations, um, and uh, we presented um, you know, some preliminary results uh, in the uh, Ocean Science meeting where we show that uh, there is very strong seasonality. And in summer, indeed, there is not much freshwater flux going on uh, southward, but in winter, there is a lot due to uh, predominantly strong uh, northern winds, which push a lot of fresh water on the shelf. Thanks, Dima. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you, know, you know, with regard to uh, Ursula's uh, paper, um, you know, she uh, years ago had a paper that said that heat flux is also useless. Um, and I think that uh, these are good thought provoking uh, studies, but um, I think maybe it's easy to go overboard on them. Um, I mean, uh, I know Rebecca Woodgate continues to calculate heat flux at Bering Strait. And, you know, with some careful thought on the reference temperature, uh, in her case, uh, the freezing point, um, uh, you know, I think it's, uh, it's these both heat uh, and, and freshwater fluxes and content uh, can be useful concepts. Um, I mean, uh, Knut Eggard was the first to, uh, or not, maybe he wasn't the first, first I'm aware of, to, to introduce this, uh, the freshwater content idea, uh, the estuary concept to, to the Arctic. And it, you know, it's just basically a, a way to, to, to uh, measure the strength of the stratification. And I don't think it's uh, something that we should just throw away, um, but maybe it can be improved. Yeah, can I just follow up on that? I mean, I, I agree with that. I think there is a danger of throwing the baby out with the bathwater here. So you have to understand what you're looking at when you have a time series of, for example, heat flux across a section like Fram Strait, which is incomplete and not closed. Um, but if you do have a closed section that spans the entire Arctic, then it all makes perfect sense. And the dependence on the reference salinity or on the reference temperature just drops out and it all works the way you'd expect. So caution is required, but you shouldn't abandon these ideas. Yeah. Well, I'll All follow right. on this. I think that uh, uh, this caution is preliminary or primary uh, due to the observational uncertainty. When you look at the model and you have closed sections and you can have a net zero volume, that actually is not that challenging at all uh, because we can we can calculate the, uh, the, the closed volume or net zero volume uh, fluxes in and out and we get the either freshwater or heat fluxes correctly. So from that perspective, I think that uh, uh, I agree with what Mike uh, is suggesting that we should be careful not to abandon our uh, methodologies uh, altogether. And my caution is that we need to make sure that uh, we can distinguish between uncertainty related to the observational uh, gaps versus the models that uh, provide you basically 100% coverage. That water looked kind of cold, Vislav. I'm sorry, what? The, the water that you're swimming in is a little chilly. <laughs> yeah. It's great. All right, uh, any, anybody else? We're at uh, 12, 17 minutes after the hour. Um, so if, if not, then maybe we can continue any conversations in the, the chat on uh, that is associated with the, with the event. Um, this um, recording will be posted. Um, by, by Liz 
and maybe it would be great if we could also get the uh, the slides uh, sets that were posting and, uh, and Laura posted there as well. Um, so from the physical oceanography team perspective, we'd we, uh, like to continue the, the collaboration with the Arctic Observing System uh, team. On, uh, and maybe we can organize a future session on uh, that covers the Davis Strait and, and the Bering Strait transports also so to cover all our bases. Uh, but our next meeting uh, will probably with, be with uh, in collaboration with the modeling sub team, and, and we will be in, on, November, on December 3rd, I, I believe, uh, where we'll be discussing gateway transport in, in models. And um, so we're also, from a physical oceanography perspective, we'd like to continue this, this discussion. Um, I don't know, on the Arctic Observing System uh, team side, um, will do you have any, uh, any contributions or any, any updates, any new? No, I had a I had a bunch of um, questions I would have liked to ask my up one of Steen's papers, so um, I may actually communicate with him uh, him directly. Um, this has been a really interesting discussion. I was um, thank you very much to our European colleagues uh, for contributing. Um, these I I'll point out these Arctic meetings are open to anybody, um, and we really would like to get more um, non-U.S. participants and non uh, particularly non-government participants. So. Um, you know, I would encourage you to, uh, um, to check out the web page, join the Arctic team, it's not restricted, and, uh, and contribute. It's been great to see a European's perspective here. So I thank you all for your, your time. And I think we will probably do uh, more joint meetings with the um, uh, physical oceanography team. So, uh, so stay tuned. I'll be looking forward to seeing the Davis Strait um, and the Bering Strait um, presentations as well. So thanks. Excellent. Great. Well, again, Oistine and, and Laura, thanks so much for your presentations. It was, it was really, really helpful. Um, if there's nothing else to mention, then uh, let's conclude it with this. So thanks very much. Yeah, thank you. Everybody have a good, good rest of the day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Nice to see you all.